for all that you do uh, in us and for us and through us, God. We thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for Ivy and, and her willingness to share her knowledge and insights with us. And we pray that you'll give us wisdom to know how to, how to apply those uh, insights and, and knowledge to each of our individual situations, God. And most of all, we focus on, on, on you and what your will is uh, for each of the families represented here and those that, that couldn't be here today. Um, for, for what your will is for, for helping one child um, that you that you want us to, to get involved with in each of those little lives. So we pray for, for your wisdom and protection uh, for each of the families here. And uh, we just thank you, God, for, for what you will do in our name. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, just real quick, my name is Chuck Verdi, and my beautiful wife back here in the, in the purple is Donna. You know, for anybody that, that doesn't know us, like most of the people here probably know us. Um, but uh, so we're the Starfish Ministry, and uh, we meet every week to help encourage and equip people uh, to, to uh, help one child at a time, to help one starfish. And so we meet every week here. So if anybody um, is looking for like a support group, you're know, just uh, interested in foster and adoption, or ways you can get involved, you don't necessarily have to be a foster or adopted parent to get involved. So please come and join us every week at the same same bat time, same bat channel, same room. Um, you know, so. You can come here, and we're here every week, and uh, no pressure. You know, if you have kids, there's of course free child care and all that too. So, with that, I want to introduce uh, Miss Ivy Gentry with the Child's Law Center. <laughs> all right, so she's gonna hey everyone, Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Um, Doctors and 
dentists, in fact, are one of the highest um, reporters of child abuse, which may surprise you, um, as well as um, clergy. And although there's a special exception for priests who are receiving confessions and that nature, however, if something comes up with the church, you are working here, be aware that, um, that folks in the church are mandated reporters if, it, if abuse does come up. Um, anyone may report. So typically a neighbor, an ex spouse or a friend, you know, someone might another parent at the school, or if you see something happening in the community, you can call the hotline. And um, and you can also be anonymous. It's important to know sometimes the relationship, you know, if if, if aunt sees her sister doing something uh, to her children, she might not want to be identified as the person. It can really cause a lot of family strife. So be aware that you can anonymously report. There could be someone uh, it could be a neighbor that you that don't want to get in hot water with, and that happens quite a lot. And um, and they're not allowed to disclose who that is. At that point, an investigation is launched by the Department of Children and Family Services. Um, it, you know, a lot of folks think of it, talk, talk about CPS, Child Protective Services. These terms are used interchangeably. The so DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, Child, Child Protective Services, CPS, but the, the name that's used here in San Diego County and LA County is now DCFS. So, so just so that you know, that's kind of what's, and I think CPS has kind of been, um, used more um, commonly here in San Bernardino County. LA County is, is fully on board with the DCFS name, but if you look at their buildings, um, there's one here now in Rancho, um, on the 9th Street, I think. It's Department of Children and Family Services, so they're, they're moving into that as well, so be aware. Um, okay, <coughs> what is abuse? This is just a silly slide, as you can see. I am not, you know, <laughs> that's what we're gonna talk about now is, is what constitutes abuse. Um, it, it's tough to kind of bring light to this situation, but I, we put a couple of photos up there that just might give you a little chuckle. But um, we'll move on from there. So, but specifically, all of the types of abuse are um, the, the code section that we use is the Welfare and Institutions Code uh, 300. It's a big blue book that has uh, all the statutes and um, that cover this area of law in dependency court. And these are enumerated here. Um, you have physical abuse, sexual abuse, general neglect, emotional harm, abuse of sibling, uh, death of another child, or cruelty, abandonment, and relinquishment. So the majority of our cases are, are um, in this top three categories. General neglect is gonna, ha gonna cover all of the things that you see us as kind of problems in the house. Drugs, domestic violence, um, dirty home, um, things like that. Uh, mental health also comes into play here. Uh, a good portion of the cases come because you have a parent or parents that have a diagnosed or undiagnosed mental disorder, whether it's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, <coughs> uh, something where they're in a place where they can't um, safely parent the child um, for reasons of their own health. Um, you may also see um, issues that have to do with the health of the child, medical neglect. Um, and that can be because the child has special needs or very special um, medical needs, but it could also be just because they can't they just are not parenting them in a way that helps with their behavior and their needs of the child. Emotional harm is on here. I, I put severe because they really, in order to, for the court to become involved, this has to be severe. Um, you know, there's a lot of parents that unfortunately may be name calling their child or doing things that are not healthy and appropriate, but to rise to the level of abuse that, it that, that constitutes a, court, a case in our court, um, you're talking about severe emotional harm. Usually these folks have been hospitalized multiple times for attempted suicide, things like that. You're looking at um, a severe level of disorder. Sometimes you have um, children who have um, mental health disorders as well, and the parents are not appropriately dealing with that. That can be under general neglect and sometimes emotional harm. They may be exacerbating that condition. But generally, physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, general neglect, those are your main categories. Abuse of a sibling is important because if there's a filing of uh, physical abuse or sexual abuse against one child, that will often place the other children at risk in the home. Not 100%, but often. Um, we do see cases where um, there's a target child, and it's because the step-parent is targeting that child or whatever it is, and the other children may be able to stay safely with the mother, for example. Or, you know, there's certain things that the court may creatively consider. So that gives you an overview as to what we normally see um, abandonment and relinquishment, just so you know, that's more under the safe haven. You know, you may, you, you probably see don't abandon your baby signs, things like that on cars. That's because there is a mechanism and those cases would come through our court as well. But unfortunately, those are few and far between. So in my 
more than eight years in this job, and hundreds of thousands of cases I've seen, I've seen two. So, um, here's the process. So this is the first part of your flowchart. How do, this goes over how um, you know the, the the hotline call comes in to the child abuse hotline, and then there's an emergency response, and there's an initial finding here. So, um, you know, there's a word on their screen now. There's some cases that they just kind of handle hand off to other providers, things like that. It's a really small percentage, and it's not really relevant to our proceedings here. That child wouldn't be coming into your care. Um, moving here into their uh, findings. Emergency response investigation. This is the initial response. This is in the first day, two days. They go out to the home, and they make an initial determination. Is there something here, or is this just uh, maybe a disgruntled neighbor? You know, you have people that sometimes make reports, and there's it, there's no abuse happening, or there's just no evidence of this. You know, maybe there's just it's so speculative. You know, I think I heard noises from their home. It sounded loud. You know what? Things happen in homes. You know, it's just you can't you can't chase down every little Benny Trado. You know, so those cases might be considered unfounded, that's it, okay? If not, if the case is substantiated, then we move to step two. At that point, when the abuse is substantiated, then the, then the uh, it, at this point still there's no court filing. But at this point, DCFS needs to decide, okay, are we going to open a court case or are we gonna divert it? So this is relevant to you um, potentially because um, if a case is diverted, I want you to be aware that there are a portion of cases that there is no open court case and the Department of Children and Family Services is still asking for someone to foster that child. And this becomes relevant for a number of reasons. This would be under the voluntary family reunification um, bucket, right, excuse me, box right here. Um, voluntary family maintenance, when the Department of Children and Family Services is involved in a family, but they're not removing the child. So, this is a step that there's a, a good portion of chase, cases where they feel that they can put services in the home, they start connecting with the family with resources, maybe they just need help finding housing, you know, maybe it's just a matter of they need a little bit of education. And it's not an abuse situation where we need to remove the child, where we need to, we just, they just need help and support. And they're supposed to provide that as well. And that's to prevent removal and to try to prevent um, those children from being part of the system when we can just help them out. Some folks just need that helping hand, and that's the goal of that. But family, voluntary, family reunification, they may come to you and they may they can have up to 180 days if the family is in agreement. So you may have, for example, this isn't super common, but imagine a scenario where some, uh, a single parent has a medical proceeding and she's gonna be laid up for three or six months and she's just, there's nothing really wrong with her parenting, but she's unable for that moment to parent her child. She could voluntarily give control of that child to child welfare services. That child could go into a foster home or other uh, relative home, and um, a court case is not filed. They have up to, if that child is in placement for 180 days, by that time, a court case has to happen. So within six months, that's the longest time, because, and that's really to prevent um, the Department of Children and Family Services from kind of preventing um, due process rights and preventing review. Um, it's important that the court oversees these cases so that you don't have an agency kind of deciding the lives of families without oversight. So, moving on. Here at this point, once abuse is substantiated and the court case is open, there's two, two potential um, avenues. The child may, may be able to be safely maintained in the home, that's a child not in custody, or you have a child in protective custody. That's where you folks come in as foster parents. And with, if the child is within protective custody, that court case needs to be filed within 48 court hours. This is quick. That initial court hearing comes right away. Um, you'll probably get a phone call. You're not gonna get any paperwork likely other than the place of paperwork and, and the child is supposed to be present at that hearing. Um, if, the, if the child is out of home, they have a lot longer. Usually we see that case, it says 15 court days, 30 calendar days, sometimes it's a month before that case comes in. And that becomes a petition that um, they're trying to maintain the child at home, such as the diversion option. <coughs> they want the court to kind of nudge the family. They need that court to, to provide kind of a stick to keep the family drug testing or whatever it is that's happening. Um, okay, initial hearing, arraignment and detention. What do these terms mean? Okay, they, uh, basically they're about the same hearing. Arraignment is essentially what, is, what are the allegations? What are the parents being accused of doing? What is the abuse? And at this time, it's important to know that the investigative phase is still ongoing. 
it's only been right away. As you know, as I mentioned, it's been 48 hours. They've just gotten a hotline call. They've just removed the, court, the, the child. They've just gone into the home. Maybe they've talked to folks, but they might not have all the information at this point. What they know is they need to keep this child safe. So the investigative phase is ongoing. Um, I'm going to skip down real quick to this. this oops, not that. The, to this, the standard of proof. It's important to note that the investigative phase is ongoing because at this stage, the standard of proof is called prima facie. That means at first glance. So to remove a child at this initial stage, within, right when that investigation is, is unfolding, it's just a bare minimum of evidence. If you suspect abuse, you know, if you suspect neglect, then you can take the child so that you can keep the child safe during the investigation. That's the idea, okay? So it's important to know that, that that initial hearing, the child might be removed. When the investigation is complete, that, that standard proof is going to increase because it can't be just a bare minimum of, of proof for a child to be in care. You have to have some proof that there's a, there's a problem here. You have to have evidence. It can't just be a suspicion um, once you've moved past that stage, and we'll get into that. Now, at this initial hearing, um, there's a couple of important things. Um, where will the child live is usually the primary um, issue on everyone's mind. So the Department of Children and Family Services removes that child, and um, and I failed to mention, when they suspect abuse, they actually have to get a warrant removal. I didn't include a slide on this. You know, you, you've seen possibly, you know, cases of law and order or whatever where they're, they're getting a subpoena to, 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 to look into the home and do, re you know, basically search the home. You have to get a, a, a warrant signed. The, the judge is on call 24-7 for warrant removals from the home. So in that initial 48 hours, they have to get that removal order signed if they're planning to remove the kids. However, at the initial hearing, the parent all counsel have an opportunity to argue whether the child should be immediately released to the parent. Um, it's not often done, but you may have a child placed in your home for a couple of days, go to this initial hearing, and then go right back home. That's because perhaps whatever was, you know, sometimes the agency may have one perspective and the parents have additional information. Um, but again, the standard here is prima facie, bare minimum. So usually the children don't return at that time, but sometimes you have a case where, for example, um, perhaps there was a domestic violence incident. And that the, let's say that the father was the abuser in that case. And he is now in jail. Mother has, has, has obtained a restraining order. She's indicating that she's not going to return to him. She is protecting. And maybe when they first interviewed the mother, they thought that she was still with him, or there was some concern that she had allowed him back in the home, or that he was having access to the children, but she comes and says, no, that's not the case at all. Here's the restraining order, I've moved, I'm in a shelter, whatever it is. If something like that comes in, the court's gonna say, yes, you know, here's your child. You know, this is, you're doing, you're taking reasonable steps, you know, these things happen. And, and, and so that's, those are some scenarios. Another important factor here is that at this stage, the Department of Children and Family Services must show that reasonable efforts were made to keep the child at home, or there was no way to do so. So certainly emergency things happen, and in those very emergency cases, for example, um, you have ch cases where the police are out of home and they call child welfare. That removal can happen without a judge's signature immediately. If they come and the police see abuse in progress or they see something happening, then they can come and remove that child right away. They don't have to wait. However, um, in that case, that's going to be a situation where there is no means. Right away, you need to take, you need to, to move that child into a safe environment. Um, however, there are times, for example, in the domestic violence scenario, did the Department of Children and Family Services speak with the with the mother, the victim, and ask her if she's willing to separate? Did they ask her if she can seek alternative housing? Did they ask her if she tried to get a restraining order? Did you know? Did they work with her? If they didn't do anything, the court may, will then order them to try to provide some services to see if they can stabilize. And it, it all make, all of this makes sense. You know, it makes sense that you would want the court to try to reach out to parents. And these are, these are parents' children, you know, so that's why these classes of RMA. And the other, the other types of things, sometimes you have a non-offending parent. You have broken home, you have split families where you have a father who's maybe not in a home and is perfectly um, capable of parenting the children, for, but perhaps mother, and vice versa, but let's say perhaps mother is doing the, the heavy lifting, she, she has a new stepfather or whatever, and she has her children, and then um, maybe that stepfather was abusive, and the children need to be removed. Well, what about this other dad? You know, what about the bio father? Is he a safe parent? So the court needs to look at that as well, because 
it's, it's the preference of the court to retain the children with a safe and stable parent first, 